chapter four. We are at the final section we're going to cover here, 4.4. And in chapter four, we've been looking at graphs of our circular trigonometric functions. In 4.1, we looked at sine and cosine, and we introduced the idea of their graphs, and we introduced the idea of their period and amplitude. And we even looked at the idea of how you might modify the graph by growing the period or shrinking the um, amplitude or something like that by multiplying the functions outside of the function or inside where the argument is by a number. And then in 4.2, we considered the same things, but translating or shifting functions by adding or subtracting values to the function or to the argument. And then in 4.3, last time, we talked about tangent and cotangent and what the graphs look like, the period, as well as shifting and stretching those functions and their graphs based on multiplying uh, by a number or adding, things like that. So the only two functions that have been left out of the list so far have been secant and cosecant. So that's what we want to introduce in 4.4, graphs of the secant function, graph of the cosecant function, and techniques for graphing, connecting graphs with equations. Um, these are the same exact things that we did in each of the other examples, and now we have these last two functions for which to do that. So they're going to begin by imagining that you could start plotting points on the graph by making a table of values. But before they do that, let me just sort of give us with a blank page here, I'll sketch it in, the idea of how we could approach thinking about the graphs of secant and cosecant together. So let's see here, if I, for example, Imagine that I was going to work with, um, let's do this. Let's say we have um, y equals cosecant of x. Cosecant of x, we want to remember, is 1 over sine of x. And so we can imagine, I think, the whole graph of cosecant of x by thinking about flipping all the values of the whole graph of the sine x function. So for example, if I think of the sine x function, maybe just one period of the sine x function looking something like this, in which it goes from zero it hits zero at pi and then comes back to zero at two pi and has its two pi period. So since the sine x function repeats all of its values every period of two pi, that means the cosecant function must repeat all of its values every period of two pi as well, because it's defined by simply flipping the sine values. So if they repeat, then the cosecant repeats. Now also, we have a maximum of one and a minimum of negative one. And the maximum of one happens at the quarter mark here of pi over two. And the minimum of negative one happens at the three pi over two quarter mark. That's supposed to be negative one. And so, for example, if we look at the first quarter of this graph, when I go from zero to pi over two, the values of the sine function start at zero and crease up until a one, and then after that, they go back down. Well, what if I was taking the reciprocal of those values? So first of all, if sine is zero, well, then if I put that in the bottom of a fraction, one over zero is undefined. That means at the places where sine is zero, here and here, and here, the cosecant function is undefined because if you plug those values in, you get one over sine of those numbers, which is one over zero, which is undefined. And as we saw, when the denominator of the fraction is undefined, then in those values, you have a vertical asymptote. We saw that with the tan and cotangent functions for the first time. So if I draw, these vertical asymptote lines here, 
I'm drawing them where the sine function would be zero, because I know if I'm graphing the cosecant function at those places, I will have vertical asymptotes. Then let's say I'm trying to um, work toward my cosecant function with the purple values. So when sine is a one, which happens at pi over two, for example, well, when I flip that, one over one is still one. So that means that pi over two, when sine is one, cosine is also one. So I'm going to put that purple dot right on top of the sine function there. Similarly, when sine is negative one at three pi over two, negative, I'm sorry, I put negative three pi over two there for some reason, just three pi over two. At three pi over two, when the sine function is a negative one, well, if I flip that, one divided by negative one is still negative one. So that means the cosecant function at three pi over two is also a negative one sitting right there on the sine graph. Now, as we were looking at before, when I gave, I think last time, an example of the one over x function to illustrate how when you flip a small number, it becomes bigger, and then you can go to infinity and have a vertical asymptote. When the sine function is one half, which happens at, I believe at pi over six, I think that's right. At pi over six, when sine is at one half, well, then the cosecant would be one divided by one half, which would give me two. So when the sine function is at one half, the cosecant function will be two, which would be like up around here. And that'll also happen at five pi over six over here. And so what you can basically imagine is that all of the values of sine as they go down closer to zero, and you then flip those, you get a bigger and bigger number. If I'm at one tenth and I flip it, I get 10. If I'm at one one hundredth and I flip it, I get 100. And so as the sine function is going down towards zero, the cosecant function is going up toward infinity. And that's why we have a vertical asymptote at zero. And the same thing is happening as sine as you values close to pi causing the sine function to get close to zero, the cosecant function is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and heading off toward infinity. So what you get basically is the, the bump of the sine function is turned upside down, pivoting on the point right in the middle where they share that point of uh, a height of one. But then instead of just going down to zero, the cup as you turn it upside down, they go off to infinity and they never actually cross the asymptotes. When the sine function is below the x-axis, it's doing the exact same thing, getting the exact same values, but now they're all negative. And so when you flip all of those numbers to get the cosecant value, you get the same thing as you had with the positive values, but negative. And so you get this flipped cup down over here that also goes and goes off to infinity as you approach the vertical asymptotes. And so this is how we can see one full period of the cosecant function. And then of course, because it's got the same period that sine does, it would just then repeat those graphical elements. If you left that segment and continued on to the left or to the right, it would just start repeating the same thing. So that's my attempt to give kind of a, a quick overview of how when you flip the sine function graphically, how you can then see what you would get for the cosecant function. So what would be different for the secant function instead of the cosecant function? Well, the secant function is one over cosine. So I would take the cosine graph and do the exact same thing. The cosine graph looks just like the sine graph. It's just kind of shifted over to the left by pi over two. It's got the bump at zero and then it goes down and back up and it has the same wave look to it. So you would take all the bumps of the cosine function and sort of flip those off toward infinities with vertical asymptotes for cosine when you get the secant function. 
All right, so let's see how they present that. Hopefully this gives us an, an overview that makes sense for folks. So with the secant function, this is one over cosine. They start by just plugging in values, evaluating, seeing what you get, plotting some points. But when they do that and connect the dots, you get these U's that I was talking about. And you get the vertical asymptotes that I was talking about. So what's in this one, which they're not showing here, is that the secant is equal to one over cosine of X. And so that what you can see is the reason the graph is the way it is, is because in here would have been the cosine function. And so the cosine function would have been zero whenever you get to the vertical asymptote of the secant function. And then it would have met the secant function when it gets to one or negative one. And then it would have been zero, et cetera. So this kind of helps you understand a little bit how the secant function comes from the cosine function. And they show just their own sketch of the graph. They show what it looks like on some sort of a Texas instrument calculator. And so then we can see one period is two pi, just because that's the same period as the cosine function, where then you get basically two of these U or upside down U shapes that would have sort of snuggled up next to a cosine function over the same period. Now we could also recognize that because they do go to positive and negative infinity, like the tan and cotangent functions, there will be no amplitude. Can't have an amplitude if you're heading off to infinity. There's no sort of peak maximum or minimum place of the function, but we do have a period. And then of course we could adjust what this graph looks like by scaling it in the horizontal or vertical directions by multiplying by numbers inside or outside of the function, in the argument or outside of the function. And you could also shift it up or down or left to right by adding or subtracting values from the argument or from the function outside as well. So they discuss properties of the graph as they did in the earlier examples and give you notation to describe it more expli explicitly. So the graph is discontinuous at values of X of the form, X is equal, and they give you one of these funky formulas again. Remember two N plus one just means any odd integer. So you basically have an odd number times pi over two. So that could be just one pi over two, which is just pi over two, or three pi over two, five pi over two. And so that's where these, these values are here. This is pi over two, that's that asymptote. Three pi over two is that asymptote. If I went over here, there'd be another one at five pi over two. Just some odd number times pi over two, you get these what they call discontinuities because the function jumps from one part of the graph to the other without touching that line. And that happens at odd multiples of pi over two, both positive and negative. There are no X intercepts. The graph never does end up crossing the X axis. These U shapes never get down to the X axis. And that makes sense because there's no way I could plug in a value for X to make one over cosine X equals zero. So since I can't make one divided by cosine X ever come out to be zero, the graph can never give you a value of zero as an answer, which means it never touches the X axis. So that means there's no X intercepts. The period is two pi as we just discussed because it's the same as the cosine function because it uses the cosine function to generate its flipped values. The graph has no amplitude as we just discussed since there's no min or max values and it just goes off to infinities. And they do point out that like the cosine function, since it is defined by the cosine function, it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And you may recall from the cosine function that what that means is that if you think of the dividing line of the y-axis right down the middle here, 
the, the graph to the right of the y-axis and the graph to the left of the y-axis look exactly the same. They're mirror images of each other. And that's true for cosine as well as secant. So this is sort of an overview of the properties of particular the secant graph. As we get familiar with it, we want to think about these properties. So now for the cosecant function, what the heck is that? <laughs> these slides are sometimes just silly. For the cosecant function, then again, you could begin by making a table of values. And the way you would do that is plug in values for X and see what you get. And we would wanna remember that the cosecant function is one over the sine function. This is the example I started with at the beginning today. And if you plugged in values and see what the sine value was, and then you flip that upside down to see what the cosecant is, you would get numbers. So for example, this is one I referred to specifically in my example. Since sine of pi over six is one half, then when I flip that one half, I get two. So cosecant of pi over six is two. And similarly, when the sine function is less than one half, like one fourth or one tenth, or the lower values that it gets as it goes close to zero, well, you, when you flip those, you get bigger and bigger numbers, and that's why you get the U shape that goes to infinity. And every place that the sine function would be zero, the cosecant function will be undefined because one divided by zero is undefined. And that means this leads you to um, vertical asymptote. So the undefined values, the vertical asymptotes of the cosecant function are the zero values of the sine function since that's what's flipped there. All right, so if they put that together, they get the picture. And this is the picture that I sort of showed you in the beginning, at least with one period of the sine function being flipped. And again, you can see that the asymptotes are the zero values of the sine function. Yeah. And it looks like your vehicle may oh. be at risk of losing coverage. Sorry, my phone is going to talk to you. There we go. Let's forget to do that completely. All right, so the zero values of the sine function are the vertical asymptote values for the cosecant function. And then, as we were seeing in the beginning, if I imagined the sine function, it would go up and meet the cosecant function when they're both equal to one, pass through zeros when the cosecant function is undefined and has a vertical asymptote. And that way you can see the cosecant function as something sort of as an extension of the sine function, what you get when you flip the values of the sine function. So again, we have our period that's the same as the sine function. Period is equal to two pi. As we saw um, with the tangent, cotangent, and secant functions, there's no amplitude. There's no max and min of the function because it goes off to positive and negative infinity. And as they just mentioned for the secant function, there's no x-intercepts. The, the, the u's never cross the x-axis. So they will give this page to describe these properties. Now the discontinuities are at just even multiples of pi, one pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, five pi, things like that. All the places the sine function would be zero. You have vertical asymptotes for for cosecant, uh, why are they saying cotangent here? So this is <laughs> this is cosecant. <laughs> the period of cotangent is pi, not two pi. So I know these details are about the cosecant function, not the cotangent function. They're just made carelessly, I guess. There are no x-intercepts. The period is two pi, like the sine function, like sine x. Graph has no amplitude since there's no max or mins. And like the sine function, it is symmetric with respect to the origin. And so basically that means if you 
turn the graph left to right and upside down, you would get the same graph on the other side. It basically means if you change the sign of the input, you get the same answer, but it changes the sign of the output. Oh, sorry guys. Sorry for that. All right, so same kind of properties, but a little bit shifted. Now they're the properties that relate to the sine function because we're dealing with the cosecant function, which is the flip of the sign. And so they say to graph the cosecant function on a graphing calculator, if you don't have this on your calculator, just remember that cosecant is one over sine and you could make that your function and graph that because it's the same thing. Same, if you didn't have a secant button, then you could use one over cosine, assuming that all the calculators will have a sine and a cosine button. At least if it's a scientific calculator, which we need for this class. So here they're trying to show what I was showing where you could put the sine x and the cosecant x graph on the same picture so that you can see how they weave together. But it just looks so crappy in these little pictures they made here. I wanted to do it myself separately. So they're kind of showing you could plot both of these together and see how they're related together, how you, you basically flip the values of sine or cosine to get the corresponding values of cosecant or secant. This will look much better, for example, if we do that in um, Desmos because they have uh, much better color coordinated graphs than these little TI examples. All right, so then finally, now that we've introduced these, we wanna remember that all of these graphs of functions can be modified by multiplying by numbers where the argument is, where the variable is, or outside of the function, and how that will cause a stretch, a compression, or a dilation along the x-axis if you affect the argument, or along the y-axis if you affect the outside the function. The argument affects the, a, a stretch or a compression along, uh, horizontally from side to side, and an outside multiplier out in front of the function, that affects the amplitude in the case of sine and cosine, um, and it stretches those up or down. And what they're saying is to deal with that when you're talking about secant or cosecant, use the, the multiple of the sine and the cosine as a guide. And again, they, they put the A here, and they left out that there should be an A here. So I'm gonna keep trying to correct these slides as we go. <laughs> just to help hopefully get whatever use out of them we can. So you could, since these graphs can kind of be seen as being one drawn from the other, you could initially sketch the, for example, the, the multiple of the sine function and adjust the amplitude and the period according to the sine function. And then once you have that, then just flip all those bumps upside down into U's and mark off your vertical asymptotes where the zeros are in order to then graph the modified cosecant that has a multiplier as well. And you could do the same thing, for obviously, for cos cosine and secant. So let's see as they perhaps illustrate an example of this. So they're saying in, in, your, in your process, use this guide to graph a multiple of secant or cosecant, sketch the vertical asymptotes, which is where the zeros would be of the original function, sketch the graph of the desired function by drawing the typical U-shaped branches between the adjacent asymptotes. And again, you can draw the bottom of the U to hit the very top of the bump of the sine or cosine function that you're using to give you a sense of where the U starts and then goes up from there. The branches will be above the graph of the guide function when the guide function values are positive and below when the guide value functions are negative. And so then they have an example. So if we use the secant as our example, like one over cosine, are they gonna show that here? Yeah, so let's, let's use their picture instead of me trying to catch it. Well, we know that this is one over two, oops, let's try that again, back one, there we go. 
one over secant is cosine of one half x. That's secant one half x, and that's multiplied by two. So you would take the flip of the cosine of one half x function, and then basically that function, when you get your use, if you double it and multiply by two, it's the same as doing, um, it, it, it rises the bumps up to two, and it rises the bottom of the u's up to two. I'm describing that badly. But so let's see how they try to begin. So first, if you think of two times cosine one half x, because that's what I've drawn here, the two is out front. The two does not get flipped. It's two times one over cosine of half of x, which can be written like this. And so if you do that, then you get bumps that go up to two. The amplitude is now two. Your period has now um, been altered by a factor of two. Since you're multiplying the argument x by one half, that means instead of a two pi period, you have a four pi period. And so you can see the start here at zero and then the end of one period now being at four pi instead of two pi. So they've created a two pi period. And that's because you this multiplier here means that the period is equal to the original period divided by the multiplier. And when you're multiplying by a fraction less than one, you end up getting a larger period. Anyway, you go through that process that you would have gone through with cosine, but then from this, once you have this, well, then you can just sketch your u's in here. And you can imagine that your u's for your, your u-shaped parts for your secant function will be just the flip of the cosine function that you, that you graphed, which they then have here. So modifying, the best way to think about a modified secant or cosecant function is to instead modify the flipped sine or cosine. Take the cosine or sine that, that you would have flipped in the secant, modify that the same way by the multiplier in the argument and outside the argument. And then when you've graphed that, then flip all the bumps into the u's that go off toward the vertical asymptotes. So now in their next example, they're doing the same thing basically for a cosecant function, which would be one over sine, and let's take a look at what they did here. So they have a number out here, so that's going to change the scale up and down vertically because it's multiplying by the function that changes in the y direction. So this is a vertical um, multiplier. And they didn't multiply the x in the argument by anything, but they subtracted pi over two. So that means this part here is going to lead to a shift in the x direction. And when you subtract a number shifting the x direction, it shifts it to the right. So this is going to be a shift right by pi over two. And again, again, these shifts, the thing to remember, I think it's buried in here, <laughs> but it's hard to see. Remember that this is equal to a times one over sine of x minus d. Or in this case, we have three halves, I said three, three halves times one over sine of x minus pi over two. And so we're gonna modify the sine of x minus pi over two function by shifting it, multiplying it by three, pi, three over two. And then we will use that to create our graph of the cosecant version. So what they're showing here is the three, three over two sine of x minus pi over two function. And again, you could then imagine that wherever the zeros are of this, when you flip a zero, you get an undefined. So the zeros will be where the vertical asymptotes are. And then you would make your graph by having them meet at the top of the bump and creating U's 
or the reciprocal function. So now the bumps used to be up at a height of one, but because it was multiplied by three halves, now they're at a height of three halves. You still have a, a period of two pi matching the sine function that got flipped, but the whole thing's been shifted to the right and been scaled up a little bit as the numbers in the function caused. So I think they'll just then do this for us as I showed sort of the process and imagining doing it on the graph. So they say, okay, here's the sine graph, sketch it in the right place with the shift and with the proper scaling. And then in comes the actual graph of the cosecant by drawing the typical U-shaped branches between the asymptotes. All right, so the, when, the, when the slides aren't sort of like mistyping things or putting things on top. The graphs they show are a good representation of how to do this. Now they can go the other way around. They could show you a graph as we have an example three here and ask you to say what function this is a graph of. And again, the simplest way to do that is to envision what's in here so that you can imagine what function this is based on. So that's sort of the, the sketched in graph of what was flipped. And so the graph that we have there from zero to four pi, starting at zero at the origin, it looks like the sine function, except instead of finishing its cycle at two pi, it finishes at four pi. And that means that the period was made larger by a factor of two. That means you must have made the argument smaller by a factor of two. And so that would suggest that we had originally sine of one half X. As we saw, multiplying the argument by one half doubles the period. We saw that in our earlier example and a couple of slides above. And so uh, since I have a peak at one, the amplitude of my sine function would still be at one. So there's no number out in front of the sine. It still is centered at the x-axis. It hasn't been shifted up or down. So really that's the sine function that got flipped. And so then I would simply flip that. And that would be the graph that's shown here. And the flip of the sine is the cosecant. And I think this x here is supposed to be over there. <laughs> this is y equals cosecant 1 half x. All right, oh, well, we're almost out of slides here. Let's see what they do at the end here. They have another example that's very similar where it looks like it got shifted up a little bit because now the center runs through one instead of running through zero. And so they end up with the one shift over there. And oh, overlapping a bunch of things. That's kind of interesting. I recently noticed your oh, yeah, yeah. Was going to yeah, sales calls are endless. Okay, so that finishes the slideshow. So let's uh, let's see if we could take a look over at uh, maybe just what it looks like to do this on a Desmos calculator real quick, and also possibly what a homework problem might look like from this sort of stuff. So if I hop over to Desmos, there aren't really any buttons at all here, but let's see if we could just type something in and see what we get. Like I can put y equals cosecant x. So we don't have to put one over sine because you can just type in cosecant in, des in the Desmos. But what I could add to this is y equals sine x. And then we can see that nice relationship between the function that was flipped and after you flip it, what it looks like. And the nice thing also is if we are on this function, I could look at the key points here and see them labeled like pi over two, one, and pi zero here. I know the zeros of the sine function are also the values of the asymptotes, the vertical asymptotes for the cosecant function. So I can say that the vertical asymptotes are at pi. And I can see each of these vertical asymptote values. <clears throat> 
Uh, so then I could, for example, say, well, what happens if I put a two into my cosecant? It seems to shrink down the period, just like we're used to seeing. And I could match that by doing the same thing to the sine function. You can, anyway, you can play with the Desmos calculator in lots of ways that, that make uh, shift it up, shift it down, change the period, and it graphs these all pretty quickly and easily. And you can have different examples with colors. So it's nice. It's, it's a good thing to play with when working with these graphs. So it looks like there's 18 problems on the practice problem set for 4.4. Maybe start off with number two, see what that looks like. So it says in seven through 10, let's make this a little bigger. In seven through 10, match each function with the correct graph. So they have some basic things for you to look at and remember here, but where we're supposed to match them are down here. Drag each of the graphs given above onto the appropriate um, in, into the appropriate area to match the functions below. So you could kind of do the ones you like first and try to find them. For example, let's say we just wanted y equals cosecant x. Cosecant x is the flip of the sine function that we just looked at. It's the very first example we looked at today. So if I go up here, let's see if I can get a little bit more window. I would say which one of these is the flip of the sine function. And so the sine function starts at the origin, has a positive bump as you go to the right, and then a negative bump after that from zero to two pi. So that looks like this one, because the sine function would be here. And then if you flip that, you get these U branches that they have here. So I would pull this in there. So then if I want to do the next easiest one, maybe the secant, because that's just the flip of the cosine. So it's going to have the top of the first bump at the origin, which then gets flipped. That's not here. So here I have the top of the bump of the origin is flipped. And then as I go to the right, the lower bumps are flipped there. Uh, so that makes sense here. We're on the negative side of that. So I would take this and translate that down to the flip of cosine, which is secant. All right, so then for the last two, the secant is one over cosine, but it's been shifted right by pi over two and flipped upside down. So that's a lot to think about. Now, keep in mind, if this is overwhelming the way I'm analyzing it, you could just type this on Desmos, see what Desmos show you and pick the one that matches the graphs up here. But I try to usually go over the problem with the theory and the idea so that the reasons behind it make sense, as opposed to just copying which one was Desmos or something like that. So to take the cosine function, secant is one over cosine, and move it to the right by pi over two, if you move cosine to the right by pi over two, it looks just like the sine function. So this will look like the sine function, but it'll be flipped upside down because it's got a negative out front. So all the positives get sent down to the negatives and the negatives get sent down to the positives. So the sine function would have a bump immediately to the right of the origin that would get flipped. But now we have a bump immediately below the x-axis to the right. And that looks like this function here. So the sine function would have been here, but now it goes down here because it's multiplied by negative and then it's flipped. And I'm using the sine function because the cosine function was shifted to the right by pi over two, and that's this function. And then without thinking about the last one, it's the only one left. You could put that down there for the final place. And hopefully I'm not way off base here. So this is the kind of things the problems sort of are looking to see if you can do based on the discussion. And you have different ways to do this. You can think about the shifts and the movement of original functions. You could also, as I said, use Desmos. I would honestly recommend you do both. My usual suggestion for students is that they try to imagine the shifts, the scaling, 
how you use a graph of sine or cosine to guide the correct graph of cosecant or secant. But then when you feel you've got the idea, take a look at Desmos and see if you're right before you like finish a problem. And of course you can see, you know, some help options for these problems in the practice in the homework set. But I would recommend that you try to get in the habit of using the Desmos graphing calculator to check the answer that you think you would get on your own without it so that you don't lean too heavily on just trying to copy what the Desmos graph shows you, that you instead use that as a check on your logic and your thoughts about what the graph should look like based on the discussions in the chapter.